start. Um, yeah, so uh, I think what we'll do is we'll, we're going to talk about what chapter 24, um, improving performance. And Stone has graciously said that he would take on the speaking, um, leading us through that. And so, Stone, I'm just going to turn it over to you. Sounds good. Um, let me open up. Hey, sorry. Make sure you put the, the start message thing for John, um, Colin. I think I got it already there. Yep, got it. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so improving our performance. Um, though I think a lot of this is just how to improve code performance in general. It is not necessarily our specific. Um, and some of my high level takeaways from this is um, contact is everything. So the more assumptions you can make about your data and your code, the faster you can make it. Um, doing less is faster than doing more. So just make the code do less things and the code that you have will run faster. So um, a pretty common thing is like, oh, is there input checking that you know doesn't apply to your data in the code? Then you can just remove it. Um, and also R is fast when it calls C. So call C as much as possible. This is where vectorization comes in. Um, but also you can look at to see where R is specifically calling in C code. Um, and try to use those as much as possible or uh, move the surrounding area. Um, so the first section is coderization and Hallie talks about there's two traps when writing or trying to optimize your code. Uh, the first is writing fast code, but it turns out to be wrong. And the second one is writing code you think is faster, but it turns out it isn't. And to avoid them, it, you just need to test it, right? So write a function for each optimization strategy you come up with and benchmark them against the original solution for both speed and correctness. Um, so in the example, he uses uh, two different mean functions. One just calls the standard mean, and the other function is sum of x divided by length of x. Um, and then using the uh, benchmark package, um, you get some nice statistics out of it and you can actually compare it to see whether your method is faster or not. Um, and then you should also check to see if the outputs are the same. Uh, the same. Um, yeah, Stone, I don't, I don't want to jump in. Is anybody else no, having correct. trouble seeing the screen sharing or is it just me? Oh, is that me? Oop, give me oh. oh, yeah. It says Stone okay. has started. I must have just must have got caught up. I Sorry, I, it was, yeah. I, was, I did want to make sure it wasn't me, so. Nope, nope. That, let me do, 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 do. Can you see my screen? Is that it's not working? Starting. Stand, stand, start yeah, it says started, but it hasn't actually happened. Yet. Yeah, it says st it started, but that's all I'm getting. Let hmm. me try, let me try because I was trying to share my whole screen. Maybe I just try a window. Yeah, that'll make you better. Anything? Anything? Hmm. Anything no, it keeps just a, It's just a stone has started screen sharing. Any chance that you maybe jump out, jump back in? Maybe that'll help? Um, yeah, yeah that. Let, me, let me try that. Let me try that. I will be right back. Do the old unplug <laughs> it and see what happened. <laughs> this is good. like the first time. This is like the first time that we've had any issue. Like, I know. Good so, that we have now as opposed to earlier, man. Yeah, that's what you're gonna do. <laughs> I mean, like if it happens in October, we might have all given up. Yeah. I can't even I can't even figure out I can't even figure out types, let alone. Uh, although I did I did have uh I did use another function factory the other the other week, so that was kind of cool. So Anything? There we go. Now I can. Yep. Now I can see myself. All right. Cool. Cool. Yeah. That's. That's to be expected. Hopefully. Right, let me have this. All right. Let me. I lost. I lost my other part now. Give me a hot second. Hi, y'all. Good. 
So, how's everybody's week been going? <laughs> Good. Still pretty early. But I had to go to the dentist on a Monday. I feel like that's the most Monday thing that Ooh. can happen to you, you know? So, <laughs> Only I'm, I'm, I'm surviving. I'm surviving. That's all you got to do. What are you going to do? <laughs> Screen. Share. All there right. Sweet. Okay. Blah, blah, blah. Coderization. And then we can run this and we see a nice um, output of the benchmark and how much faster uh, the just running the sum versus the mean is. Um, and he notes that mean is considerably slower because it makes two passes over the vector for like numerical accuracy reasons. Um, in the next section, he talks about doing as little as possible. Um, so the easiest way to make a function faster is to do less work. Uh, one way to do that is to use a function tailored to the specific type of input or output. So this is kind of going along with saying where like if you can make stronger assumptions about your data, then you can use um, more efficient functions for it. So row sums versus call sums are faster than running apply um, sum over the matrix. Um, in read that CSV, if you specify the column type, then it'll load your CSV faster. Um, two that I've actually used several times are cut and unlist. Um, if you set the labels and names to false, it actually is quite a bit faster. So if you're not using them anyway, you can just get rid of them. Um, and then especially in cut, I've noticed that it's extremely slow if you use labels. Um, so in 2.4, he mentioned you can sometimes make a function faster by avoiding method dispatch. So the mean function is a generic function. So if you use it on um, different types of objects, it has to find what the correct method to dispatch to is. Um, and then if you, uh, for pretty small loops, you can um, get some performance by directly using the uh, correct uh, function. So mean.default is the one that is used on numeric vectors in R, um, whereas mean is the generic that has to dispatch to mean by default. Um, and then um, dot internal mean X is where R calls into C to do the um, to do the calculations. So that's like the fastest way, but also uh, the most dangerous in the sense that it does um, no input checking, so no NA checking, no input checking. Mean that default only works on numeric vectors, but if you have NAs in it, it'll also handle those as well. And then mean is the most generic version, um, which is the safest to do. And then um, we see that the internal mean is the fastest by far, uh, but in uh, 200 nanoseconds versus 2.5 microseconds. Um, but this is only mainly because the vector is so small. So if we do a larger vector, then the um, additional benefit you gain shrinks down quite a bit to almost nothing. Um, and that's because the function's already spending so much time computing things versus doing the dispatch. Mm, yeah, that was the one question that I had was like, why like when you scaled up or where your data got larger how this like benefit went away but that makes sense it's you're optimizing based on method dispatch but if it gets larger then that optimization by method dispatch really doesn't matter anymore so right yeah so like the difference between the mean dot default and the dot internal is only uh, six microseconds, which is probably the overhead required to do all the dispatch. So if you're taking 100 microseconds, then six microseconds isn't that much to pay in terms of cost, uh, time cost. Hmm. Um, yes. And I think a good portion of this too is also like 
you should do all these benchmarks on something that's realistically sized or like at least close to realistically sized to um, the actual problem you have at hand. So if you're just like benchmarking on like one number, then of course the internal one would be much faster, but that's not, that's probably not the type of data you have, right? And that's kind of goes back to the initial point of like um, context really matters and like understanding your data really well will help you sort of understand what trade-offs are worthwhile. Um, the second example he uses is as.data.frame. Um, and it's pretty slow because it coerces each element into a data frame and then R binds them together. Um, but if you already have a list that's in the correct shape of a data frame, all you need to do is set the class name to data.frame and set the attribute of the row names to uh, the row names of um, of the the list itself, and then return the list. So really, all you're doing you're not really changing anything. You're just adding some extra text, um, and this is considerably faster um, because you're not actually changing anything versus as that data frame where you're co converting everything into a into a data frame and then are binding them together. Um, and then later on in the chapter, um, it's mentioned that doing stuff like R bind, C bind, or C is very slow or can be very slow because it requires like data copies and that sort of thing. I'm not 100 sure about R bind, but I, I think it is quite slow because of that reason. So yeah, we see this is almost um, 200 times faster than on. Um, so just attached to text is 200 times faster than um, doing as that data dot frame. Um, but if you have a list that isn't the correct shape for the data frame, then you'll get an error. So um, that's the major downside, I guess. Um, one of the example questions in the book is what's the difference between row sums and dot row sums? Um, so I've copy and pasted the source code from them. Um, and I thought this was a very interesting example because you can see in dot row sums, all it does is call out to the internal function row sums. Whereas row sums itself does a lot of checking, right? Are you a data frame? Is the dimension correct? Is, the, um, is it complex? Uh, that, that sort of thing. Is the length correct? Uh, add the names back in um, and then return the data frame. Whereas if you knew that it wasn't complex, you wouldn't need this section at all. You can just use delete, start deleting parts to it. And um, that ends up being a lot faster um, because you know what your data is. But obviously the downside is you don't get those checks. Um, and this sort of gets to something I actually do in my own work a lot when I'm trying to optimize some R code is I'll see what the uh, so whatever R function I'm calling, I'll see where it's actually calling into C and try to use that as much as possible. And like, I just go back and check to see like, okay, is any of these, are any of these checks actually useful for my data? Cause especially cause I do a lot of simulation data. Um, so I do a lot of bootstraps and that sort of thing. So I know exactly what my data looks like because I'm generating it. So therefore I can just like, oh, I don't need to worry about like checking for NAs or that sort of thing. So yeah, so this entire function, the dot version is just calling out to the C code, which is essentially right here. Um, so the next section that Hallie talks about is uh, about just vectorizing. Um, and I mentioned there's two benefits to vectorizing. One is it's easier, it can be easier to think about the problem because instead of thinking about individual components, you can think about entire vectors at a time. And the second benefit is that uh, vectorized functions are written in C and not R. So even like if you do like a vector A plus a vector B, the plus operator is actually calling that in C and not R. And that's why it's super fast compared to if you went element by element inside R. Um, and he mentions that like, uh, 
you should be so for example like row sums call sums row means call means they are all vectorized versions of these function of um functions so they they'll essentially call into c a lot um and then other functions like cum sum and cum and diff um and so like one thing is like okay you actually just need to like like a good way to figure out performance of R is to use vectorized functions, but also like you need to know what the vectorized functions are. So um, that can be just like reading <laughs> our documentation, I guess, or like Googling like what are vectorized versions of something you're trying to do. Um, he mentions uh, vectorized subsetting. So um, here X is dot NA X set to zero will replace all the zeros um, all well, the NAs with zeros, and this happens in a vectorized fashion. Um, another thing is like if you're extracting, replacing values in scattered locations in a matrix or data frame, subset with an integer matrix. Um, to be honest, I'm not exactly sure what that does, but I assume besides like probably improve performance somehow. Um, I'm not sure if anybody knows. I guess like the one thing that I had was it, it like, I just wish Hadley would have provided like when he said vectorize, cause I know it's been, you know, like he says, it could set a lot. I just wish he would have provided like a simple definition. And so I actually had to go, like, I kind of understood it a little bit, but then I had to go and like find another blog post that just put it into very simple terms. Right. Yeah. And it, it, you know, just the idea of like, try to find the functions that are, you know, translated into C or C++ because it's going to make it a lot faster. And so I just wish Hadley would have done that in that, like, in that section to be like, this is what vectorization means in very simple terms, but let's talk about how we can use it to optimize. So that was my only critique about that section. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's, right? a yeah. Term, that's a term that gets tossed around a lot in the MATLAB world. And I think that may be where they borrowed that from. Because I know in the MATLAB world, they always tell you to vectorize your code, vectorize your code. Why it's so slow? And you spend like yeah. hours trying to vectorize your code, so it only takes a half an hour to run instead of uh, <laughs> one hour. So net time increases, but that's okay. You vectorize it for next time. Because my like my misconception with that, like when you say vector, I think of like vector, like the data type of vector, right? I don't it think is. about that's it. exactly what you're doing. You're trying to create, you know, try to operate on whole vectors rather than like individual things one at a time, like with loops. Usually you think about eliminating loops, but it's not just that. It's like trying to ex re-express your code as in terms of vectors of things. So it's, you know, sort of parallel. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, it just gets kind of confusing. So I just wish you would have been like, in really simple terms, this is what I mean in this section, da 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 da, da. So, but that's just- Doesn't he say something like that about linear algebra? I thought he said something like linear algebra. Yeah. Fast. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think there's a kind of confusion because like, in computer languages, right? Like vector yeah. sometimes just means something that you can add values to, like grow, grow a vector in like C++ or something versus yeah. like vector in math where it's like a mathematical object. I think um, it's the math. I think it is the math version. I think it does come from MATLAB, you know, but I'm not mm. sure about that. Maybe it's older than MATLAB. Yeah, I remember doing stuff like that in Mat MATLAB where it was like, because instead of thinking like if you have a vector of like 10 values, instead of like thinking, oh, I want to do the first one plus the second one plus the third one or fourth one, and like each element by element, you just think of it as one big vector plus another vector and just adding those two things together. Like um, I just posted here, this MATLAB has to say about it anyway. It's mimic. <laughs> But like you say, yeah, if you do things as vectors, the point is that you're, if you're using vectorized, if you're using functions that call vectors, it's actually calling a C code to take care of the whole thing. You're not doing some kind of loop and uh... Yeah. And that's like what, with Python, you got NumPy, because it's much faster to work with uh, the underlying C code. Yeah. Or a GPU, if you're using Torch or something like that, right? <laughs> Um, okay, so the next section is uh, avoiding copies. Um, 
so in general doing anything with like memory and such is really slow um so you like copying memory around copying data around is a lot slower um, than computing on it so um for example uh, if you use c to grow an object in a loop um then what happens is that r will have to allocate space for the new vector then copy all the data in so and then after you do this a, a bunch of times that copying and allocating new memory operation gets very expensive and um, can take considerable amount of time um, so in this examples the uh where's collapse yeah, so the collapse function is looping through. Um, and uh, in this case, it's, it's talking about like when you're building these, um, when you're building a, an array or a vector of strings, um, this one is, okay, out is now the original out paced together with a new X. So this is kind of equivalent to using C. Um, so you're progressively building up this vector and because of that, um, it's a lot slower because you're continuously um, creating a new sp memory space for the new vector, copying the old data with the new addition, going back and forth. So we see that this is considerably slower um, compared to the method of um, using a, a, a vectorized function that automatically can allocate all your memory up front and then do it um, in, in one go. So like this collapse version where it's repeatedly pasting together a vector in the loop. So here versus paste, which can automatically see all the values up front and then put them all together. And then we see that, um, so the difference between a, a string of 10 is not so bad. It's three microseconds versus 17 microseconds. Um, but when you get to larger and larger size, that the difference in performance grows more and more. Um, another thing that can happen is um, modifying an object inside a loop can create a copy depending on the class of X. Um, and it says to go back to 2.5 to learn about this a little more. Um, so basically, usually when you modify an R object, it creates a copy, um, but there are two exceptions. When you have a single binding and if you're using environments, um, there is a super annoying thing that um, RStudio, if you're using the environment pane, the environment pane causes a reference to your objects in memory. So even though there's no other references in it, it causes a reference. So then it causes copies in the background, um, which has bit me several times before, where I'm like, I don't know why my like matrix of data is just like randomly copying every time I try to modify it. Um, so there's actually an option to, um, instead of refreshing the environment plane automatically, do it manually. So I have that switched on on all my work computers just because like, I've had multiple times where I have these like giant like, um, like multi gig matrices. And then for some reason, there's like references attached to it, even though I haven't touched it. Um, and it was, I'm pretty sure it's because of the fact that like, if you do um, the, the environment pane will cause references. If you do a function like um, head or tail on it, it'll cause a reference to it and then it'll create copies, um, which gets really nasty, really fast. Um, so yeah, you can either turn off the environment pane in our studio, or if you do the modifications inside a function, then you usually are okay because it can't see the inside of the function. So the object's not living inside of the global environment anymore. Um, so yeah, I've had I've had that happen a lot of times, um, which is super annoying. So yeah, so if you create a matrix here and prior lets you see the refs, even though nothing's happened to it yet, the there's now four references on my mat and then if you modify it, um, you'll see, okay, it's created another copy of it. Um, and then if you give me a second and I'll turn off the environment pane and then 
so now the environment pane is off and I'm pretty sure, yep. So now you only have one reference to it. So yeah, this is something that has actually gotten me several times before. I was like, why is this taking so long? <laughs> Yeah, actually, they, they did mention that early on in the book. I forget when, but somewhere really on, early on, they're talking about environments. They're talking about this issue. Yeah. So, so they made us do some of the experiments or what do you want to call it? Exercise in the, just in the terminal because otherwise you'll get that problem. Yeah, exactly. I didn't realize you could uh, just turn off the pain though. That's yeah, that works pretty well. You have to make sure it's like not generated <laughs> before you turn it off. So I've just switched mine to manual refresh only all the time, just because for that reason. Um, and then, yeah, it's, uh, if you just use the typical, like terminal instead of the GUI, like our studio, if you use like the, just the regular R GUI, not the R studio version, then it's fine as well. Uh -huh. Um, and then the other one is if you wrap it in a function, then it can't see, um, it in the environment and that's okay as well. Um, yeah, so they, did a case study. Um, I let me. What do you, you guys see? Are you guys seeing my main screen right now? Let me, let me share this. Um, yeah. So there's a case study um, that Hadley goes through about t tests. Um, and it's pretty interesting. Um, and it's actually very similar to what I do. So basically, um, first thing he does is, um, is uh, not use the formula syntax, which causes like a 4x slowdown versus using just you know, your regular function syntax. Um, and then the next thing he notes is that, okay, if you look at the source code for the t-test, you'll see that it computes a lot of other stuff that would, he didn't necessarily want. He just wanted a statistic, right? So he basically is like, okay, let's rip all that stuff out and just have the basics that we need here. So this is what we see here, where here's the new t-stat function and he computes it on the two groups and he returns that value versus, um, uh, yeah, t-test default. Like if we just compare the, the sizes of the functions, like you can see, oh, this is like an enormous amount of code, right? Um, and then from here, he's, he's like, okay, I get a six X speed up just by doing that. And then he replaces these functions, mean, length, and sum with the vectorized versions on a matrix. So instead of, um, I think it's, yeah, instead of doing it um, essentially element row by row, he does it in his uh, matrix format and uses row means and um, row sums, and he gets an additional um, 40x speed up from there. Um, and then, yeah, so I actually had to do something similar for my own work where I was doing, um, like I was saying, I was doing a lot of bootstrapping and uh, time series simulations. Um, so one of the functions for that in R is Arima sim. Um, and even here, you can see that there's like a ton of ton of code. Um, and all sorts of stuff. And then um, I'm not sure if you guys went over like profiling and stuff, but like besides the code, it's in general being slow. There was a lot of stuff where like, oh, this TS converting to a time series was quite slow. And I'm like, okay, um, just kind of going through like my thought process. I was like, okay, well, it seems like that's happening twice. That seems kind of confusing. Why is that happening twice? Um, and then it turns out, like, if you look at the other functions, filter is also converting to time series. So we're actually converting a time series, or something that I know is already a time series, into a time series like three times. Um, so basically, there was a ton of code that was repeated. And then because I knew I was like simulating data, I was like, okay, where in this code is it actually calling out the C and like, how much of the extra code do I need? And that basically it ended up that all I needed at the very end of the day was just th these two lines of code was um, just call that call into the filter function with my simulated data. And part of that, or a lot of it is just like, okay, I know exactly what my data looks like because I'm simulating the data. So I'm like, oh, I don't need to check for any of these things. 
I'm not using it as a time series at the very end of the day. I'm just using it as like a raw matrix data because I'm using it in a bootstrap. So I don't need to convert to time series. I don't need to do any of these things. So I was basically like stepping through the code and be like, okay, what can I get rid of? What can I get rid of? What can I get rid of? Um, and at the end of the day, I basically just had these two lines, which was important because I'm doing these like massive, you know, 100,000 simulations at a time for, you know, um, just so for some context, I have global, global climate data for every point on the globe by like 72360 over like 100 years. And I'm like trying to simulate this for tons of data sets. So it ends up being like an enormous amount of data. So every, every little bit I could shave off helps like drop down the uh, simulation time quite a bit. Um, so you'd have to spend less time waiting around, um, which makes things uh, less annoying. Um, yeah, that was all I had. There were a few things I didn't quite go over. Um, uh, one thing was checking for extra solutions. Wait, let me check another screen. Uh, so he mentions, okay, has somebody else solved this thing but faster? Um, so he recommends checking um, CRAN task views, which I don't know if anybody else has seen before, but I think it's actually pretty fun just to look at all these different topics. Um, so these are just like curated lists of packages on, on all sorts of different topi topics, which some of which I didn't even know existed, um, which is fun. And um, basically you can like click into it and see a bunch of recommended packages related to a topic and they'll talk about performance as well. Um, and I think there's a section on high performance computing. Um, so you can see what other, uh, what other developments there are around different sorts of packages, parallel computing, GPUs, um, large and out of memory data. So you can use uh, big LM also by Thomas Lumley um, to use out of, uh, out of uh, RAM data sets um, and fit linear models to them and that sort of thing. Um, and then he also recommends if you reverse dependencies of RCPP. So um, an RCPP reverse depends are all the packages that use RCPP and um, which we'll get to next week. Um, but because of that, you can sort of assume that these packages are faster than your uh, typical R packages that are pure R. Um, so also kind of fun just to like walk through and see what crazy things that people are building as well. Okay. Um, that's all I had. No, oh, it's not run to one hour at all. Uh, that uh, uh, fan view thing is really cool. You gotta check that out. Yeah, it's actually it's actually super fun just because like there's so many things that I like I've heard about that I have no idea about like oh like hydrological data oh I didn't know there's an entire section about it um, and it's like curated by like one or two people who are experts in the field so you know these are like oh here like here are the packages that people consider like very legit mm. for this field um, which is uh yeah I don't know it's just kind of fun just to like walk through and read around and like see what other things are happening. Um, like um, I've been looking at sort of ex extreme value theory a little bit. So we have a section on extreme value. So you can see like, oh, here are the packages that um, let you fit extreme value distributions or simulate from extreme value distributions um, and that sort of thing. Cool. Yeah, I found the I found the time series analysis one to be pretty good. Um, well, it's it's curated by Rob Hindman, um, who's yeah. like if you do any like time series forecasting stuff, his name yeah. will certainly pop up. He, I mean, he wrote the book Forecasting in R, so mm -hmm. it's a really good book yeah. too. Which is yeah, that book. Yeah, that's, another, that's another one of those books I need to read. I, I bought it. I uh, me too. Read yeah. It. Um, but yeah, I, I think these fantasies were like the past couple of years, weren't they? Like people were starting to put them together and then CRAN actually like started hosting it on the CRAN project or had um, they been around for a while? I 
feel like they've been around for a while. I'm not really sure, though. Also, my sense of time is kind of messed up now. So. <laughs> <laughs> I also... I also enjoyed Hadley's, like, he pointed out some of the stack overflow um, stuff that he did with, like, the optimization stuff. I thought that was kind of neat to kind of read through and, and see his approach. Yeah. Um, how he kind of answers some of those questions. Like, that was kind of cool as well. Um, yeah, definitely just, like, working through case studies and that sort of thing has been super interesting just to see what... Um, what are sort of like side areas to go down? Like what are things to consider when you're optimizing? Um, and then obviously like using the profiler is probably the most important thing, right? Where it's like, um, when I like profile my code, I'm like, okay, how much time is spent in C code versus R code? And like, cause at some level, right? You can't really, if once you're in C code, there's not much faster you can go. So it's like, okay, well, if it's 99% C code, then I'm like, oh, I'm done. There's like nothing else I can do here. Whereas if there's like 90% R code and 10% C code, I'm like, okay, there might be some space here. Um, well, your C code might be uh, might need some optimization too. Don't forget. Yeah. So just because well, it's in C doesn't mean it's doing the most efficient. Right. 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 <laughs> well, yeah, but the, the at that point, it's like, okay, now we might need to do the RCPP section, right? So it's yeah. like that's probably the way to go. So yeah, not it's not necessarily that the C code is. The fastest it can be it's probably not by far but it's oh you mean like, using like the dot internals that you mean not yeah running, yeah exactly. not running your OC. that probably is well optimized i'm sure it's been used yeah. for a long time yeah yeah I, i'm saying more just like okay if i'm like okay i wrote some a bunch of functions and stuff and it does what i need to do and i profile it then i'm like looking to see where my code's spending its time right and i can sort of like anytime my r code calls into some sort of c function i'm like okay that's I'm not going to make that any faster. There's nothing I can do there. But if there's like a lot of R code that's um, being called, I'm like, okay, maybe there's some room for improvement here just from like a simple, you know, copy, paste, cut out some stuff and that sort of thing. Um, versus like, okay, if it's spending a lot of time in C code, then it's like, okay, either you need to make the C code faster and rewrite it in RCPP or something like that. Um, but that's sort of like my thought process behind like the optimization limit, like, um, low hanging fruit, so to speak. Right. It's like, oh, okay. The easiest thing to do is, okay, if I know my data well, I don't need to do these checks, just start deleting all these checks and that sort of thing. Um, and then try to get as close to just our calling, passing my data into C as possible. Um, yeah. hmm. Very cool. Yeah, I'm also, I guess I'm also trying to wonder too, like dependency wise as well. Like if you have certain dependencies or packages that you depend on as well, how, you know, I guess maybe I'm just kind of thinking out loud right now, but you know, other people's functions, you don't necessarily know if those are optimized. So it's always good to kind of look at the source to see if there's like some, like you said, low hanging fruit to which you can yeah. like cut out. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's where the like the debugger helps a lot. Where you can just like, okay, where where is it going actually? Because um, I've used like some fitting functions that use L moments or what whatever um, for specific types of distributions. Um, so it's like, oh, this package which is like producing a distribution for drought, for example, like a drought metric, is calling this package, is calling this package, is calling this package. And all those packages are designed to be very general, right? Um, so it's, there's like a lot of stuff that's happening that I don't need. Um, so like, it's like, oh, it's like computing things like super accurately into like 20 digits. I actually don't need 20 digits. I only need like three digits. So I was like, okay, let's like only make it do three digits and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, like using the debugger, I can figure out where the code is. And then I just start copying and pasting it together and be like, okay, do I need this? Do I need that? Do I need this? Do I need that? And Let's say like nine times out of ten, I don't need most of it, just because I think it's also particular to like the because I do a lot of simulation work um, to that type of data. Because like, oh, I, okay, I know exactly what my data looks like, so I can just like be like, oh yeah, I don't need to check for NAs or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's that balance of safety versus speed, right? So yeah, that's that's really neat. Well, I think you're the right person to do this because it sounds like the your yeah. day to day is constantly spent on optimizing your code. <laughs> Like for me, I can kind of get away with like code that isn't like super optimized, but it sounds like your like your type of work was like perfect for 
leading us in this in this discussion. Yeah, it's something I've had to do fairly frequently, which honestly is kind of annoying, but <laughs> that's all right. Uh, but yeah, just because like the data sets are so large, so you just get like a lot of weird issues coming up. Like one file is like thirty gigs, so it's just like a pain in the butt. Um, if you accidentally copy some data, then you're like, oh, well, there's all the 30 gigs in my RAM. That's annoying. That's crazy. Yeah. That's, re that's, that's interesting. So uh, does anybody else have any other like comments or questions or anything that they else, anything else that they want to discuss? Nope. All right, cool. Yeah. Next week's it. Who's so? Who's who's doing? It's, it's Ron, right? Ron. Is yeah, it? I'm the stucky on that one. I'm. I'm. Uh, you're. Uh, you're bringing us home. Yeah, I got a lot. It's gonna be a busy week because I got the uh, ROS one, which is a long chapter, and this thing looks a long chapter, and then I'm gonna prepare for some. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say RCPP is like an entire language, so <laughs> it's like a book's worth of material. It really is. I mean, it's pretty dense. I mean, it's pretty dense in there, but. I mean, don't be, I mean, I, you know, I don't want to speak for other people, but I mean, don't feel like we need to do the whole thing either. If we need yeah. to extend it out for two weeks, you know, I'd rather like, yeah, we'll see when I get into it, how, how rough it's going to be, but um, yeah. Yeah. So just let us know. I mean, like we can always extend it or like, you know, if you want to try and get it all in one, that's fine too, but I would kind of read forward. It's, there's a lot of stuff in here, but you know, so, but you just let us know. Okay. Like I said. Yeah. No, we'll get All there. Right. All right. Good deal. See you guys. Cool. See you. All right. Well, everybody have a good one. All See right. ya. You do. Bye. Bye.